All right. So today's class, I wanted to give you, um, uh, again, for those of you that just joined, um, this is a bit of a repeat or a rehash from the huddle that we did on Tuesday. But unfortunately, I had um, problems with the uh, resolution on the screen and wasn't able to show you anything. So this time, I'm hoping to get more value out of this by actually showing you uh, the disclosures and samples and examples of things on how to read the disclosing the closing disclosure the alta and the hud okay these are terms first off before we get rolling into this all of these things closing disclosure alta and hud are terms that are for the most part interchangeable um the closing dis it, it, you could generalize it and say all of these are closing disclosures um but they all look a little bit different and all serve a slightly different purpose, okay? So the closing disclosure that you are looking at right now is typically the format that you see that is coming from the buyer's lender, okay? Um, and this is the one that has to be sent three days prior according to um, RESPA and the rules of RESPA. Um, it has to be sent three days prior to the closing and fully acknowledged, okay? So what this looks like is, and you are likely to get a copy of this. Um, if you don't get a copy of it, you can always request it from uh, your buyer's lender, or you can say when, you're, when your lender sends it to you, please send me a copy, I'll review it with you and make sure everything looks good, okay? So what you see on the closing disclosure it, it, in this particular format is more geared towards the buyer's loan. So in this case, you see the buyer's, oops, undo, undo, edit, undo. Didn't mean to do that. Turn that off. So in this case, you see the buyer's loan amount, what their interest rate was, um, and what their monthly principal and interest payment ends up being, okay? Um, you also see their estimated tax, insurance, and assessments uh, of 255 bucks a month for homeowner's insurance. Again, I did not mean to do that. Edit, undo. Um, and you also see the closing, dis the, the closing costs. And you see the estimated um, cash needed to close, okay? So this is the number that hopefully should be familiar to your client because you've done a net to seller earlier in the process and estimated based off of what they, not net to seller, cash needed to close if you're dealing with a buyer, net to seller if you're dealing with a seller. Um, this should be pretty close to your, your estimate, okay? You can also see the breakdown of the borrower side of the transaction and where all of these numbers came from. To be honest with you, this is really not in your wheelhouse, um, uh, but you need to be familiar with it in order to be able to address questions that your, your client might likely have. Um, you may be asked the question, hey, do I really need an owner's title insurance policy um, for, you know, 1400 bucks. And what would your answer be? I'm seeing heads nodding. Why? I'd love to hear, hear an explanation for why. Well, because um, I did have a closing that didn't close because the title was clouded. And if that was in fact true, they would have been um, up Shits Creek without a paddle. It would have been a problem. So always, well, always, always get title insurance. Well said, it's cheap insurance. It lasts you for the entire lifetime, your entire lifetime. If anybody ever were to come back, even after you sold the property five years later and somebody came back 30 years after that and, and made a claim against the, the title and your ability to sell that property, it would still cover you or cover the, the buyer of the property up to a million dollars for them to defend. In most cases, I think it's a million dollars for legal fees to defend the fact that you own that property, okay? It's, it's very cheap insurance, all right? Um, 
and then you see the cash needed to close. Okay, this does have the seller side of the transaction on it, but as you're going to see here in just a minute, it's it's very rudimentary, it's very basic, and it's not super accurate because. If you look on here, typically one of the things you're going to want to look at on the seller side is what are the commissions? Because, hey, that's kind of important to us, right? This is how we make our living. You're not going to see them here because this is the document that is coming from the, uh, the buyer's uh, lender. Okay. Now let's transition and we're going to look at this is the Alta. Okay. Alta is from the American Land and Title Association. Is the, is the root of the acronym for ALTA. Um, and in this document, there are two different formats and you might see it like this one where the seller is on one page and the buyer is on another page, or you may see another format where the borrower is on one side and the seller is on the other side uh, in columns, okay? In fact, we're gonna look at one here. Here's an Alta, and we're going to look at this one in more detail, but this one has the seller on the left and the borrower on the right. So they, there's no right or wrong. They're, they're both equally effective. Okay? The things that you typically want to look for in, um, in the Alta, I've highlighted already. One, you want to make sure that whatever the earnest money amount is being accounted for appropriately, um, who's holding it and where it's, where it's at. So in this case, there was a $6,000 earnest money deposit that was sent. Um, and notice you're also wanting to look for due from the borrower and go figure $92,682 and a few cents that actually dovetails exactly with the same amount right here. Okay, so in this case, there wasn't a change from the preliminary CD that was sent three days prior to the closing by the lender to the closing. Sometimes you will see a slight difference. And um, a good conversation to, and an expectation to set with your client is um, there's always the possibility that it might be slightly different, that there might be you know, something that changed or, or if the closing gets delayed a day or two, um, the, the amount is going to change because there are prorations and now you have a couple of extra days. So it's always a good idea to advise your client, bring an extra, bring your checkbook. Um, and, uh, or in some cases you may want to tell them, you know, if you get your wire, you're representing the buyer, you got to wire funds to be able to close, um, send an extra 500 bucks, send an extra thousand bucks. You'll get a check back at the closing and that will just solve that problem. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, the, one of the more important things. So first we, within this case, we just looked at the borrower. We also want to look in this case, the seller instead of in the other column is further down. Where was the seller side? Borrower. Okay. So here's, here's the seller side. We want to make doggone sure that our commission is correct. Okay. I could care less about the other side's commission. It's nice to know, uh, but you wanna make sure that our commission on our side of the transaction is correct because that's your payday folks. <laughs> All right. Um, here's one other thing that you may wanna look for and I don't think I have an example of it. If you, oh, actually I do. It's right here. Um, in this case, we had asked for the seller to provide a home warranty. Um, and this was part of the amendment to address concerns that we had written, okay? So in this case, you wanna make sure that that home warranty was actually on the HUD statement and it was being paid for by the seller. So in this case, home warranty, 210 home buyer's warranty pay and the seller paid $510 for the first year, okay? And that was part of what was in the amendment to address concerns. Okay, any questions on anything so far? Okay, we're gonna to go to another one and just look for some additional examples. In this case, this is a, a Alta combined settlement statement. This one is just an Alta 
settlement statement. That's the difference between the two formats. Alta combined settlement statement has both the seller and the buyer on one sheet of paper. Okay. And I like this format the best because you can actually see something that is a debit on one side of the transaction is a credit on the other side of the transaction for things that are prorated. Okay. So in this particular case, um, I represented the buyer. So I had this side of the transaction. We were holding $8,000 of earnest money. So I see that that was accounted for here. Um, I can see all of the loan charges that were involved with, the, with this particular transaction. I can see the property taxes. Again, you see pro rate, there's a payoff on somebody's mortgage on that side. And in this particular case, um, notice there's, there's our commission on our side. Notice there's no commission on the other side. Anybody want to speculate why? This was actually an, uh, an a, the seller was actually a licensed agent. So she apparently didn't take her own commission and um, had some kind of a deal. Again, I don't care. I'm only interested in that side of the transaction. <laughs> okay. Um, and in this case, I represented the buyer. So we had a very, a very distinct conversation about, okay, this is the funds needed to close. Um, and we had conversations about wiring those funds in a plenty of day, plenty of time in advance of the closing. And also just as a note, this is what the seller's walkaway number was, was at. If I was representing the seller, this would be the number we, that would be the most focused. Okay. Any questions on anything you see here? Anybody see any numbers that don't make any sense or that you want to ask about? What's all the title stuff below? Uh, like, if you go down, there was a title. All of this? What is all that? <laughs> um, okay, so this is title lenders. So this is a lender's <laughs> title policy, um, storage fee. So <laughs> So these are all fees that are essentially charged for the closing. Um, so they're going to keep these documents like this title storage or this document storage fee. They have a legal requirement to maintain these documents, I think, for seven years. Somebody correct me if you if you know I'm wrong. It's either seven or 10 years. Um, and that costs money to, to maintain documents digitally or electronically. So they actually charge a fee for it. Settlement or closing fee, this is, this is what Moreno typically uh, charges. Uh, title and tax search. So when they do the title search, you got it there. And then here's the owner's title policy. Uh, title commitment fee to Cedar Crest title. Uh, I don't know what that one is. But I mean, they're all pretty much, so this one had lender's title insurance and it had owner's title insurance. Notice the difference, the lender's title policy covers the lender. The owner's title policy um, is additional and it covers the owner. Make sense? Okay. All right. So let's go and look at one more. All right. Um, so this is a HUD, an Alta settlement statement, and this is the combined one for another property. Um, and uh, this is the one that we got from the, uh, the closing attorney. In this case, it was Stephen Law Firm a couple of days prior to the closing. Um, in this particular case, I represented the seller. So you see what the uh, sales price of the property was, a couple of county taxes and assessments uh, listed on here on the seller side of the transaction. Then you see the real estate commissions and the real estate commissions hang on so this is going to that side of the transition the transaction why is this number so low compared to that one anybody got an idea i 
it was probably one of those um, flat listing um, companies that uh, instead of the MLS, you, you can list your own, especially since the um, property owner was a an, an sales agent herself, a, a real estate agent herself. Could that be? It could be. There's actually another reason in this case, and I'm trying to find it. And that looks like it's, what, a half a percent of, uh, what's the sales price again? One, uh, uh, one, four or five. One fifteen. Oh. That's like less than a half a percent, isn't it? Yeah. So actually, I don't think it actually shows up on here, but let's let's switch to the other format. OK, so this was this was the preliminary that they sent us several days prior. OK, and notice what the what my sellers walk away was estimated then. OK, this, however, you talk about if you talk to anybody that's old school, that is familiar with the HUD statement, um, this is actually a HUD. Okay, HUDs you only see, they've all almost for the most part been replaced by the Alta form or the closing disclosure format. But a true HUD is a format that is specifically for the, uh, the, the, the government housing and urban development um, office. And this form is still used, but it's only used in cash transactions. So this is the one that is the final signed document. Okay, let's look to see what we can see on here. One, we see that the earnest money was deposited and you see it uh, on this side of the transaction as well as over here. The earnest money hit was in this case held by Keller Williams Realty Metro. Okay, uh, first payoff. So there was the mortgage payoff. Seller's contribution to closing cost was another thing that was on this particular one. And notice this number, um, which is uh, cash, wait a minute, from the borrowers with that amount, this was the amount that we ended up getting from the closing, the total disclosing. Where is, okay, so I'm trying to find the, the format that to explain what I talked to you about before. Okay, it's actually right here. All right, right here, you see what was on our side of the equation, as well as what was on Keller Williams side of the equation. Commission paid at settlement was only this amount. Why is the difference? Right here, note $4,000 being held by Keller Williams Realty. Okay, so in this case, Keller Williams didn't send the earnest money over to the closing attorney. They just did a, they just did a subtraction from it. Does that make sense? So this amount is offset up here by this amount. I know that's confusing, uh, but it actually makes some sense. <laughs> Did I lose anybody? Maybe. These are the details uh, that you see, 6,000. These are the details that you see plugged in up here. The 6,000 right here. Is, is it, detailed down here. Is this the, is this the same property you were doing before? So yeah, this is sixty four ten Wedgwood. This is the Alta statement, the preliminary. This is the final. Why is the sales price so much higher on the HUD form? That's a good question, and I don't know the answer to that question. This was the true sales price of the house. Okay. This was, again, the preliminary that was done days before. Okay. So that's, that's a real good question. Don't have the answer.
but this was the one that was the most important. <laughs> okay. I feel like I lost y'all. Where did I lose you? Was this part confusing on the HUD? They're so different. They can be. They can be. Okay. What other questions do you have, folks? Congratulations to Athena. She's writing an offer today. Ellen, Ellen is on and she's writing an offer today. Yay. And Tracy has what, two Yay, under contract? Hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> Exciting times. Congratulations. Uh, indeed. Indeed. Okay, everybody, we finished just a couple of minutes early. Um, if anybody has any questions you want to go into any greater detail, hopefully just having that familiarity, being able to see what a closing disclosure looks like, what a HUD looks like, and what an Alta looks like um, should be able to help you. Uh, if you ever get in a situation where, it, you know, you're getting pressed for a question or you just want to understand it better in the real context of your particular transaction, you know where I sit, come by, say, hey, let's take a look at it. We'll do the numbers, crunch the math, and we'll go from there. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day. Talk Thank to you. Soon. you.